We're going to take a lot of like important context issues off the table. We're going to get the principles. Yes, sir. Preventive services. You want her to get preventive services from the healthcare system, yeah. like dental care. Dental care is important. Um, services. Nutrition services from the healthcare system. Like, what kind of nutrition services do you want her doctor to be giving? Doesn't necessarily have to be a doctor. Yeah, a nutritionist. You should have access to a nutritionist. Um, okay, what else would you, um, any other kind of preventive services, mammograms? Yeah, yeah. You want a system that does mammograms? I agree with that. Mental health. Mental health. Mental health. Okay. Mental okay. health. Availability of, of mental health services. <laughs> you may know something more about your mom than I do. No, I'm kidding. We all need mental health services. We all need mental health services. Back there. More current. I'm sorry, two different questions. Good quality health care, I like that. And I'm sorry. Most current technology. Most current technology. I want a system that has the latest MRI. Mm -hmm. What's that? I'm sorry, sir. Mm -hmm. Immunization. You want a system that has a high immunization rate. Anything else you guys want? Yeah. Dental and vision. Okay, we're not going to get into all the details of all this stuff, <laughs> but I do want to lay out some principles. So access is certainly very important. And part of access, you brought up cost, so you want to think about a system that's not super duper expensive for her or for the, and then you want really good quality, right? You want to be pretty comprehensive. Is that all right? That sound about right in terms of what we want? Okay. So we're going to dig into a lot of details on each of these. Um, what I want to do is that these are the three big things that everybody talks about. And I will just say as a side point, about three years ago, um, I was at a, uh, I was visiting a, a western province of China, a, a relatively small province of about 80 million people. And, uh, and I was speaking to the guy who runs the health system of that province. And I was asking him, what are the big challenges you face in this western, relatively poor province of China? And he said, I think of our problems in three buckets, cost, quality, and access. And what I found remarkable about that state is that is exactly what you would hear in Washington, D.C. It's exactly what you would hear in every national capital. The, the issues around what makes a good health system, it sort of triangulates around these three broad set of issues, which you guys hopefully have identified, okay? So thinking about that, I want to spend a little time, and I want to begin by talking about a paper of ours that we published about six months ago. And I want to tell you a little bit about this paper, because almost all the data I show you comes from this paper. And the background of this paper um, is about a year and a half ago, a, a phenomenal economist at Princeton, a gentleman named Uwe Reinhardt, who uh, very sadly passed away about a year ago. Um, and Howard Bogner, who's the editor-in-chief of JAMA, um, began talking about the fact that there hadn't been a good international comparison about how America stacks up other countries in a long time. The last one that I believe had been done was back in 2003 when Uwe did it, uh, published a paper in public affairs called It's the Prices Stupid. Um, and uh, it's quite a good paper. And so that began a process by which Howard and Uwe and I talked, and we decided we were going to take this on. And I'll explain our approach a little bit more in a second. But fundamentally, we were interested in looking at a broad set of metrics in the US and in 10 other high-income countries. Okay? And our approach was pretty straightforward. We first picked 10 very high-income countries, big countries, and, and wealthy countries. So we were interested in comparing America through UK and France and Germany and Denmark and I'll show you the list, uh, Australia, Canada, Japan. The idea was we want countries that are really high income. We don't want middle income countries. And we want countries of some size, right? So we're not, we don't want to think like Monaco. Monaco is a lovely place. It's very wealthy. But it's really not clear how you compare the health system of Monaco to America. This difference is size. So we picked 10 countries. I'll show you what they are. Um, it wasn't picked with any specific approach beyond uh, that. We use data from the OECD. How many people in the room have heard of the OECD? Great. So about half of you. OECD stands for the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. 
it's a multilateral organization. What that means is it's made up of member states, there are about 30 countries uh, that are members. They're all high in some middle income countries. Canada, US, most of Western Europe. And almost every international comparison you ever see about America, other, almost all that data comes from OECD. OECD is made up of countries, member states. We have a representative in the OECD. And they work with ministries of health, statistics offices to get data. They, they do other stuff too, but they're like the source of all international comparison data from my They're really, really good. They're, they are the gold standard. And then we supplemented it a little bit with some, some stuff from the Commonwealth Fund, which is a nonprofit uh, organization in New York that does some nice international comparisons. Okay? And then here's the last part, because I'm going to show you a bunch of data, and some of it you're not going to want to believe. And you're going to get skeptical and say, did the guy make it up? The answer is, they didn't. Um, but we didn't even just trust the OECD, even though they were very trustworthy, especially on data that seemed hard to believe. We went back to the country of uh, statistics offices. We went to experts in each of those countries. And we verified. And when there was disagreement, we got people on the phone. And we worked it out. This is our best effort. It took us a year to do this. It was our best effort to try to get the data right. And the last point I'm going to make about methods is getting the data right for me wasn't getting the single most accurate data. <laughs> it was to make sure we were comparing apples to apples. So if we had made a certain change in definition for one country, we might make sure we made the same definition change for every other country because we wanted to get the comparison right. So the primary goal was get the comparison right. Okay? And you'll see in some of the numbers what I mean by that. So that's our approach. That's my entire method slide. I have no more methods unless you guys have any other questions. So let me just um, get started. So access to care. How might we measure access to care? We've heard this, some of this. You want to think about access to zero? We know. How would you measure that? Um, yeah. Time from making employment to the time for a Oh, so that's one measure. A kind of timely access. I, I heard that earlier. How about at a broad national level? What do you usually hear about access to care? What's that? Uninsured rate, right? Uninsured rate. That's the positive. So let's start there. Percentage of people covered. Here's what it looks like. Let me just point to the countries. Denmark, UK, Japan, Switzerland, Canada, Australia, Sweden, Netherlands, France. DE is Germany, not Denmark, that's UK. Um, here's the median, here's America. One of these doesn't look like the others. Um, the reason we did it here is because of us, it was me to drop a little more. Uh, the bottom line is, pretty much everybody is close to 100%. We're not. This is not a surprise to anybody. This was closer to 84% uh, when the Affordable Care Act was passed. Uh, you know, is it 90, is it 91? The latest CDC uh, survey suggests it might actually be like 91.3. Doesn't matter. We're somewhere around 90 to 92. Okay, about eight to 10% of Americans remain uncovered. Let me make one point which I'm not gonna get into but I'm happy to discuss. Um, which is, coverage is not coverage is not coverage. So we're not even talking about access once we have coverage, which is the, can I get in to see a doctor or hospital? But what's covered is a really important issue, right? Because you can have coverage, but it doesn't cover everything. That is a really critical issue that countries struggle with all the time. So one of the things that people love pointing out is that China has 95% coverage. But the insurance schemes that people that cover China, so China's ahead of us, is very shallow. And shallow coverage means if you need to go to the doctor, sure, that's covered. But if you need bypass surgery, it's not covered. It's the opposite of insurance. Right? Insurance is supposed to be about catastrophic, really expensive stuff. Chinese coverage is shallow coverage. Now, almost everybody's covered, but not for the really expensive stuff that gets people. Yes? Well, so maybe this really goes to the cost column. You can be covered, you can have deep coverage, but if you have such um, barriers of cost to use it, yes. that you're way underinsured. Yeah. Right. And though it's interesting, what, you, what does one mean by underinsured? Because typically, underinsured definitionally has been that you don't have deep coverage, <coughs> and then you hit your cap, and then all of a sudden you're naked, as they say, from an insurance point of view. 
but, but about 60 million Americans are now in high level health plans, and that has all sorts of implications for how people use health care services, which I'm happy to talk about. Um, other countries generally don't have that. They well, can you talk a little bit about the sort of cutting edge, you know, therapies like pharmaceutical and yeah. the coverage in the country? Yeah. Like the, the newest Pfizer or whatever. Yeah. Is that available? So the answer is it varies. Um, but there are treatments that are available here that are not in some of these countries. So if you're thinking about your mom moving to the UK or Netherlands or France, um, for most basic stuff, it's fine. But if she needs certain super expensive treatments, it may not be available. And that's because part of the reason those, the way those countries keep their costs down, we'll get to costs in about a minute, is they restrict formulas. They negotiate. So here's the key thing about negotiation, guys. You're going to hear lots of people say, you should be able to negotiate right now. Sure. But negotiation requires one very important thing, which is that you can walk away. If you can't walk away from a negotiation, you can't negotiate. Right? Does that make sense? Because if the other party knows you have to say yes, then you can't negotiate, right? Because they will keep sticking to you. So in other countries, people walk away. The Ministry of Health walks away and says, we're not covering that. And that is a really critical part of what allows them to have leverage. Of what's not covered. Of what's not covered. Yeah. You see that you come right across. No, so it's funky how they do it, right? So sometimes <coughs> it's not covered, like NICE just says this is not happening, it's just not covered, and it's not covered. A lot of the times the way they do it is they say it's covered, but only these doctors can use it, and only if they've done A, B, C, D, and E first. So sure it's technically covered, but almost no one can get access to it. So it ends up being a really technical comparison that has to be done like a lot of work. Somebody would have to like take a year and just do that. And there's got to be someone here with a year. Yeah, and they got a year. <laughs> Starting now until October 9th, 2019. No, that would be super interesting to do. I have not seen that done yet. Yeah. Right? So just understand that like negotiation is great, but you got to walk away. You've got to be able to walk away. And other countries do. So countries have 100% coverage, but not everything is covered. And that's, that's just, uh, it is what it is. Okay. Um, I just want to take a minute to talk about who's not covered in America. This is obviously not precise. This is just rough. I want you guys to sort of understand this is kind of where we are right now. If you look at the 10% of Americans that are not covered, about a third of them are, are young, relatively healthy people. <coughs> about a third of them are undocumented uh, individuals, and about a third of them are working. Okay? Um, if we expanded Medicaid in states like Texas, we would make huge impact on this group. We almost completely wiped that out, wiped out the uninsured in those people. Um, <laughs> later, if you want to help these people get insurance, expanding Medicaid would do that. Um, this requires really, I think, a bunch of different things, including increasing the fines for not participating in the ACA exchanges and a bunch of other stuff. And there is absolutely zero political will for dealing with that. That's kind of where we are. But you know, that's the ten percent that remain. That's who they are. Paul, <coughs> it's not exactly a third, but I figured I want you to have a feel for what's on the shores. Questions on that? So somebody said they didn't want their mom to have to wait very long to see a specialist. Here's what that data looks like across the country. Okay, um, this is people having to wait two months or more to see a specialist. And this is a survey of individuals. So this is not actually looking to see who's waiting how long. It's actually asking people, hey, that last time you needed a specialist, how long did you have to wait? 13% uh, of people as a mean said they had to wait two months or longer. It was really high in Canada. And it's pretty low in the US. So one measure of access, not the only, but by one measure of access, it's not bad. America. But if you love your mom, which I plead that all of you do, uh, <laughs> then France, Germany are good places for her to go. If she doesn't have to want to wait. Netherlands is fine too, Switzerland. But then, and then the UK and Sweden get a little bit tricky. Question? Yeah? Does that only include people who have actually made an appointment? Yeah, it's from the 
Commonwealth Fund survey of people who are active users of an operating system. Okay. I'd have to go back and look at the original sample, but it's it's people who are so it's not asking the general population because most of them would like that. Um, this is also a survey from the Commonwealth Fund asking people who have seen a physician in the past year whether they felt that adequate time with the physician. What's really interesting about this is that 86% of the people you pay said, yep, I had adequate time with my doctor. Only 81% of the, in the US. So we're a little below average, not terrible. Canada's a little worse, Sweden's a little worse. Um, but what's really interesting is which country has the longest visit length among all these countries? Where do you actually get to spend the most amount of time with the doctor? Anybody know? Yeah. America, by a lot. Average visit time in the UK for the GP is 10 minutes. But like that's actually how it's scheduled. If you go 12, you're running over. Right? Um, for us, it's closer to 20 minutes. 20 minutes feels pretty rushed for those of you who've been clinic. Uh, these places, the visits are 5, 7, 10 minutes. That's it. Yes? It's supposed to be documenting during, of course it's challenging, and so people uh, build in breaks to try to catch up on documentation, but yeah. You don't get to do half a day of playing and a half a day of documentation. That'd be great. Yeah, I just can't imagine how to do it. One topic we have not mentioned yep. in terms of access, you may, you may mention it when you talk about quality, is uh, the availability of primary care physicians take care of people. So I, I lived in the UK for a year and a half. Yeah. And everybody had a primary care physician, yeah. including uh, non-citizens yeah. like myself, who yeah. assigned to somebody. And so a 10 minute visit with someone who's seen you for 15 years is not the same as a 10 minute visit as, as a new patient. Yeah, that's a great point. Let me get back to that in a short point. Uh, ability to get same day appointment, again, these are just survey questions from the Commonwealth Fund. Uh, or a little below, it's hard to get. But it's interesting, 51% of Americans who've seen a doctor uh, thought they could get an appointment on the same day. Um, but most countries are around kind of 50, right? The Netherlands and Australia being a little high, Canada and Sweden being a little high. My take on these is, you know, we're a little below average, but we're not like crazy outliers, right? Access, once you're in the system, seems to be okay. And so, Access is multifaceted. For the 9 to 10% of Americans who are uninsured, I would argue that access is terrible. Because every time you go see it, somebody you're going to get wallowed with a big bill. <coughs> but for the, for the insured, access looks about average. Of course, in some areas, better than others. So certainly comparing America to other countries, uh, access, that's kind of how I see it right now. Your views may differ. Any questions before I move from access to cost? OK? <coughs> Um, everybody knows this, right? Which is we spend a lot more than everybody else. It's the point I made yesterday, I was going to reiterate. Um, if America did not exist on this graph, you look at this and your eyes would wander and you sort of look at the fact that the UK is kind of low and Switzerland is high and Sweden's a little high. And it's interesting, there's actually a good amount of variation. It's just that it all gets completely swamped by America. We just spend so much more than everybody else. And if you live in Europe, you actually spend quite a bit of time thinking about these issues. Like, if I believe, for instance, that the UK is underspending on health, and there's some evidence to believe that. Uh, Switzerland and, and, uh, is a little bit on the high side. It always has been. It's always been a, uh, a bit of an expensive system, and there's a, a bunch of reasons why. But again, none of that subtlety shows up once you start looking at America. These are 2016 data, and 2017, that number for America has gone up. Uh, but we just didn't have good comparable numbers for every other company, so I'm showing you the last set of data. Okay. So the big question is why do we spend so much more? And this part is no repetition. I'm looking at that crowd over there who was there yesterday. I know there's a few others. Um, but why do we spend so much more? And then this is the one equation that David let me get, up, uh, get away with putting up an equation yesterday. And very dangerous for an economist to put up an equation, especially when you're like just a doctor. Um, but uh, the point I want to make, and, and David's going to push back on this, I know, but I'm going to go ahead and make it anyway, and then keep 
he doesn't have a mic, I do, so uh, I'm use that to my advantage. Uh, is if you look at that total spending, it's made up of two things. And so I, I said the same thing yesterday. Let's say um, we think that David uh, spends twice as much on donuts uh, than I do. Okay? Let's say he's, he's uh, spending twice as much on donuts than me. There are two ways, essentially, that you could be spending twice as much on donuts. He could be buying twice as many donuts. He loves donuts, he buys them twice as many. I eat a donut a day, he eats two donuts a day. Right? That's a quantity issue. It could be that we both just eat one donut a day, he goes to a gourmet donut shop. And his donuts are twice as expensive. Or it could be some combination thereof. And price has a lot of things built into it, which I'll get into. But it's not, but basically total spending is quantity times price. Everybody kind of buy that, like how much you spend is made up of how many and how much you pay for. Okay. So one of the things that's been kind of brought up over and over again in every health policy today is that the problem of American healthcare spending is a problem of overuse. Our culture of overuse. Americans love healthcare. <coughs> we go to healthcare and use it all the time. Whether it's Americans demanding it, or doctors giving it, or the fee-for-service system that encourages it, it's all about quantity. So I'm going to show you some data about quantity. So one thing that I've certainly heard over the years, like many, many times, is we're really quick to go to the doctor. Like, you know, we get a little twinge of back pain to the doctor. Got a little sniffle, I'm going to the doctor. Whereas the Europeans, they're different. They don't go to the doctor so much. So one simple thing is just to look at doctor visits. And here's the mean, and here's the man. So Americans, on average, go to the doctor four times a year. The mean across these countries is 6.6, and here's Japan. The average Japanese is going more than once a month. That's average. Right? So there is a lot of variation, but we are at the low end. So it certainly doesn't seem like the problem is that we're going to the doctor too often. Now, I can tell you our doctor visits are a bit longer. But in terms of this idea that like it's, we're just over-medicalizing, going to the doctor for everything, at least this one small statistic makes you wonder, maybe that's not the issue. Yeah? This is just physician providers. It's a good question, because we have non-physician providers, NPs, PAs, etc. Um, they make up a small number in the US. They make up a small number in other countries. It varies from country to country how much. Um, but there just wasn't reliable data on non-physicians across all these countries. So all we could do is visit visits. But a vast majority of visits in our country and in other countries is physicians, visits, non-physicians, is make up a small number. Okay. Questions, comments, data? So there's just two things. So one is I mean, part of the doctor visits in Japan is that doctors play a role in Japan that's a little bit like pharmacists, right? They dispense drugs. So it's a reminder, you know, that you need to look at sort of, you know, the whole system rather yeah. than the other thing is that, um, I don't know if Alan Garber, your provost, has ever shared with you his Japan doctor joke. No. <laughs> okay, so you should know this. I gotta know this because I'm not used yeah, to this. Yeah, so, so he tells this joke. Apparently, this is the funniest joke a Japanese doctor has ever heard. Um, so, so basically, it's like this doctor comes every day to the clinic, and you know, day after day, and the doctor keeps encouraging her not to come, and um, you know, she's there every day regardless. Yeah. So one day she doesn't show up. Oh. So the doctor is very concerned. So you know, he urgently calls at home. Comes to the doctor, why did you come? She says, oh, I didn't feel good. <laughs> <laughs> Usually I come out with like a Jewish thing. But, uh, that's Alan, so Alan will know that joke. All right. That's, that's, that's a good joke. That's funny. That's good. All right. Um, <coughs> is maybe we don't have enough doctor visits. And we don't have enough prevention, and we don't spend enough time in primary care. And the problem is, we're not doing enough doctor stuff, and everybody's ending up in the hospital. And that we're, and the hospitals are much more expensive. And so one theory has been that we don't do enough prevention, we do too much, and too much acute and intensive care. So we looked at hospital discharges for population. And this is what we found. Um, Mean is 149 per 1,000 people. 
Here's the good old US of A at 125. Germans love spending time in hospital. <laughs> um, like a lot. And it's discharges. So this is not length of stay, this is how many times do people get admitted to the hospital. Somebody's going to ask me about observation status. <laughs> the answer is, if you included observation status, that would bump this up to about 135. And I had no data on observation status in those other countries, and some of them don't even have it. But observation status doesn't get us from 125 to 250. Right? It's a small proportion. Um, so the big point here is, oh, and the length of stay, which country has the shortest length of stay? Among, like, among these countries, the US, America, the US. So if you then do discharges times length of stay, it's the second equation, but I didn't put it up. Uh, if you think about the number of days people actually spend in the hospital, we're way near the bottom. Japan is a little lower on discharges, but their, their length of stay is about three times ours. Our average pneumonia patient, three to four days in the hospital. Average pneumonia patient in Japan, about 14 days. For those of you here yesterday, I was making this point that I was in Japan and I saw patients who were on oral antibiotics once a day, oral antibiotics, still in the hospital being observed. <laughs> you know, make sure that legal flock is still in. I'm going to watch them for the rest of the day to make sure that the pharmacokinetics of that drug is working well for them. To me, it's insane to leave the hospital for 14 days for a normal pneumonia. But it, the, the hospital starts off late, so we can stay. <laughs> We spent far too Okay, so, so it's not doctor visits, it's not hospital visits. So, what other ways I can do this? So maybe it's um, that we use too many tests and procedures. And there's a little bit of evidence here that the answer is to make. Um, so here's MRIs. MRIs for population, here's America. Uh, sorry, this is the mean, here's America. We're hot. Here are the Germans, a lot of MRIs. Um, but big variation, right? And we're on the high side for MRIs. We do a lot of knee replacements. Why do we do so many knee replacements in America? Because we can, sure. <laughs> Obesity leads to osteoarthritis, <clears throat> leads to the need for knee replacements, right? So um, actually, obesity rates in the population pretty closely predict knee replacement. And we're right there. So that's high. And then we throw in hip replacement. We're actually a little below average. That's interesting. Hip replacements from slightly different set of stuff. Obesity matters, but it's not the only thing. And then I'll throw you one new data point for those of you who were here yesterday to see this, which is coronary angioplasty. TCA, here's me, and here's America. We're a little on the high side. Look at the French. <laughs> right? Like, everybody's getting an angioplasty. <laughs> Their, you know, with their uh, cheese and the wine and all that. But but the rates of angioplasty in France are very high. Uh, you know, here's, but the point on this is, sure, we're a little above. But it doesn't look like that's the dominant story that gets us three trillion dollars of healthcare spending, where everybody else is half that, right? It just so my story, my take on utilization, on the whole price quantity thing. Is it, is it utilization? Is that what explains us spending so much more on healthcare? I believe that higher US costs are not primarily about utilization. After all, we have fewer hospitalizations, fewer doctor visits, and tests and procedures are a bit of a mixed bag, right? We do more of some things, we do fewer of other things, and the way I've always thought about it is the bottom line is we're above average on some, below average on others, and on average, we're average. Right? If you look across 20 different utilization measures, we're above average on about 10 of them, we're below average on 10. That's what average looks like, that's slice. So I don't think that's a dominant part of how we get to higher health care spending. And this is, this is disturbing to me, because for 10 plus years, certainly by my friends and colleagues who were deeply involved in crafting the Affordable Care Act, the story has been that American healthcare spending is out of control because of overutilization. Deeper service drives doctors like you and me to put our own financial interests ahead of those of patients. Too many, too, too many tests, the 
commit too many patients, <coughs> and we get to a system that's out of control of utilization. It's a very good story. In my mind, it just turns out not to be correct. Right? Because countries that don't have paper service, utilization doesn't look that different. And so that should that bothers me a little bit because it's just very antithetical to the broader story uh, that we were thinking. I'm going to get into what does drive some of the higher spending, but let me see if I can take questions uh, on this set of stuff. Anybody surprised, bothered, annoyed, totally expected? The crowd was here yesterday, hopefully it was expected. Um, uh, yeah, back there. Uh -huh. I think this is striking because you talked a lot of like changes in insurance policy and like deductible plans. These are all centered around reducing utilization and like giving the patient like you know financial incentives to spend less. And I think this is like really interesting because it suggests that that is just completely ineffective if that if overutilization is not the problem. So let me make one really important disclaimer. I made the same disclaimer yesterday. I have very good friends who work at the American Board of Medicine Foundation um, who have worked launched the Choosing Wisely campaign. And they get very upset when I show these slides because a lot of the implication is overuse is not a problem. So let me kind of make the subtle point that I think is important here, the nuanced issue, which is I think we do have overutilization in America. We all, as practicing clinicians, know we have overutilization. We've all seen it. Tests that were unnecessary, tests that were repeated that shouldn't have had to be repeated if we had a really well-functioning system. People who got hospitalized who in a better world, would not have needed to get hospitalized, right? The point is, overutilization is not a uniquely American problem. We still have it. We could still do better by reducing some of that unnecessary stuff. It's just it's not uniquely American. And the reason why that becomes so important is you can't look for, towards uniquely American causes for overutilization. You can't blame American culture for overutilization in Germany. I mean, you can, but that would be weird, right? <laughs> like, you can't blame our medical malpractice system when the, when the hospitalization rates in Japan look so much different. So that's my point, is that the international comparisons don't tell us that there's no realization. We have it. It's not uniquely American. The causes are not uniquely American. In my mind, and I'll take your question, in my mind, the cause of, there are, two, there are a bunch of causes of opioidization, but a lot of it is about dealing with uncertainty. On the physician side, a lot of it is what's your risk tolerance for this patient at this moment. That's what makes us order tests that in retrospect probably weren't necessary. Or admit somebody that, boy, they probably could have gotten away with being at home. But these are, these are tough things to balance. And doctors in all countries struggle with them. Yes? It seems to me like, that a lot of what drives um, care is, is basically the standards of care, what is standard and where you're operating. Yep. And it seems to me that America, the U.S., has sort of created <coughs> a lot of the standards of care that have become international standards. And so that even if they don't have a fee for service, that the standard of care was created in, a, in an environment that in which the fee for service forces were operating, that that, that that has been exported internationally, and so it's no longer, it's not the fee, it's just that becomes the standard of care. Mm -hmm. And I think that thing of uncertainty is, I mean, that's, that's built into the standard of care. Yeah. What degree of certainty you need to do anything. Yeah. So it's an interesting question that we've sort of exported American-style medicine uh, to all of these countries, uh, from Japan to Canada. Um, <coughs> I mean, again, you have to sort of think, there are two points that I guess I could say. One is, um, it, when something transfers from here to another country, no country adopts it wholesale. So I would have expected some influence, but not a complete adoption of our kind of our practice style. Um, and there isn't one American practice style. There's so much variation within our own country. There's so much variation in these countries. Um, that I, I don't know how to reconcile that, but it is entirely possible as a mechanism that American medicine has taken over the world. Yes? Along with that, is, are you sure this is an apples to apples comparison? I mean, there's a lot more people in the United States, so is it, I don't know, I'm thinking like compare Minnesota to Germany or something, or compare so Massachusetts that's, to Germany. These are all population and level, but <clears throat> right? these are per thousand people. So of course, yeah, yeah if I just put up like the total number of angioplasties, 
us versus Sweden, we'd be like 40 times because we're 40 times the population. So this is population adjusted. There's sometimes we do age adjustment, sometimes we don't, but it starts getting a little tricky. This is our best effort to do uh, apples to apples. Your point about um, states, I'm going to come back to in a few minutes because it's a really critical part of uh, the discussion I want to go to next. Anything else? Yes. Just a quick comment. I, I appreciate that you said it seems that fee for service is not the problem because many of the solutions that have been put forth in the last decade have been targeting the fee for service model. And that seems like people have got the problem wrong um, because fee for service can be done successfully in other places. and keep costs low, keep quality high. Yeah. And, and we're spending a lot of effort to reframe how we pay for healthcare without effectively identifying the right problem. So, yeah, and I want to just be a bit more nuanced on this, right? Because it's not that fee-for-service isn't the problem. Fee-for-service is a problem in the way that we do it. Yeah. But fee-for-service does not lead to poor quality or utilization. It's which fee for what service. So I always say, okay, if fee-for-service doesn't give us enough, Mammograms, because we think mammograms are good. Pay the doctor ten thousand dollars for every mammogram they work. Every man, woman, and child will get a mammogram. <laughs> right? Like the point is, you get the fees wrong, you get the quantity wrong. So a lot of it is what do we pay for and how much, not the fee for service thing itself. People are like fee for service doesn't encourage prevention. Pay for prevention. Again, give the dollar, a, give the doctor a thousand dollar bonus for every nutritionist they refer the patient to, if you think that's a good thing to do. You'll get a lot of nutrition business. My point is that we, we have taken simplistic approaches like fee-for-service bad, uh, accountable yeah. care, uh, you know, capitation, putting doctors at risk, good. And these are subtle. Those, they are, I'm not a fan of ACOs, for instance. I think ACOs are doing a lot of good. But, but there's even a subtlety there of how they do it. I don't know if this is the right time to raise the question, but <laughs> always right. you know, redirect me if that's the right one. So I think you know the, the probably the seminal contribution of the economics literature in the past 15 or 20 years is the point that led us to what you're describing. This tape right here was you know Cutler, Newhouse, and then um, all the the price of Yeah. Right? And what they show basically is that the the price that we pay for being a heart attack risen more quickly than inflation. Yep. Um, yet each way in which we are treating heart attacks has gotten cheaper. Yes. And the reason that the average has risen is that we have moved towards more intensive things um, as compared to less intensive things. Yep. And so that in fact what appears to be a constant sort of quantity of heart attacks is in fact an expanded quality or quantity of services. Yep. So, so you know, and, and you think about uh, you know the, the, the cost of the angioplasty. Well, you know, in, in the United States, you can't really do angioplasty unless you have backup finance, right? And so that is a hidden cost. Presumably, it should have some effect on quality. So, are, are, is this the right time to have that can discussion? I, can I come back about 15 minutes? Yeah, that is fine. I'm going to spend five minutes, and I'm just going to blow through a bunch of new data to make two points. Okay? And then we'll stop and then I want to actually spend the rest of the time talking about quality of population health, all the really important stuff that you care about your mom when she's going to Europe um, that we haven't talked about. So if it's not quantity or if it's not primarily quantity, what is it? Um, so one thing I want to talk about is administrative waste. This is from our paper. There are lots of ways of measuring administrative waste. This is the way the OECD does it, looks at governance, administration spending, primarily around payment, how we're paying for health care. The mean across these countries is 3%. Here's the US of A, really kind of as an outlier. The only point I'm going to make is Netherlands and Switzerland are both primarily private driven systems with private insurance, and they figure out how to do it and not to do it. So, in my mind, this is not a public versus private argument. Public systems certainly are, but often much cheaper. Uh, but the point is here's Switzerland that's primarily private, here's Canada that's single payer. You see a one percent difference, right? So you can get much more efficient um, in a public system or a private system. Just we do it. There's a bunch of administrative things we do that are particularly bone-headed, and this is just one way to measure it. There are other people who measure administrative costs at much higher numbers, but this is what we could do from a comparable. So administrative costs are a chunk. Um, okay, so if we're talking about 
this. The administrative cost goes into prices, but let's talk about prices. <laughs> prices of what? So the thing everybody focuses on these days, because it's sort of a politically hot topic, is price of farm. Oh, that's me. Well, Windows and threat protection. Windows has a big pack. Total spending. Total spending per capita on pharma. Here's the mean. Here's America. We spend a lot more on pharmaceuticals. By the way, we don't use a lot more pharmaceuticals. We just spend a lot more on pharmaceuticals. And, and about twice as much. Um, and this really does become obvious when you start looking at individual drug prices. I, I initially, in the first draft of the slides, had like 10 of these, and I was like, I'm going to kill you guys, I'm showing you 10. So I'll show you two, but they're all the same pattern. Right? This is how much other countries pay for test scores. This is how much we pay for test This is a biologic, here's how much we pay compared to other countries. Basically, I can do this all day. I keep showing you that for almost every pharmaceutical, we're just paying a lot more. But pharma makes up about 15% of all healthcare spend. Pharma actually argues it only makes up 10%, but that's bogus because they don't count like in hospital and other types of pharmaceuticals. <laughs> so this is the real number. Uh, this is from the ASPE uh, report. This is kind of 15, 16% is what we think of all healthcare spending is pharmaceuticals. So even if we're paying a lot more for pharma, that can't explain it all. Right? You guys buy that? Got to be something more than just pharma prices. That can't be the whole story. So let's look at some other uh, prices. Um, here is generalist physician salaries in America and elsewhere. Um, our primary care doctors get paid a lot. Our specialists get paid a lot more, and that's a that number really um, hides a lot of variation. If you're a pediatric infectious disease doctor, you're not getting 316. But if you're an orthopedist in private practice, you're not getting 316 either. <laughs> right. Only in a bad year. Actually, not in a bad year. It's hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine. Bad, bad year. Uh, Can so I the point is, there's a lot of variation. In these other countries, you don't see specialists making six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars. It almost never happens. A very small number that are in a very elite private, but generally you don't get that. You get that much more here. So both for specialists and generalists, I, mean, I see a hand which I'll yeah. do in five seconds. Let me just make one point as it comes up. Um, we, our doctors pay for our own medical education. Okay. They're doctors, so that what is my question. <laughs> and so we come out with a bunch of debt, average debt 200 to 50. If you amortize that over a lifetime, Sherry Lee, who's one of my favorite uh, health economists, after David, of course. Uh, but really brilliant. Uh, she did some really nice work looking at how much of a physician salary bump would you have to provide to make up for medical education debt. And it's about $25,000 a year. Because amortized over a lifetime, that would pay for the medical education. So that doesn't explain this, but it does contribute a little bit. Now that people get into the psychological costs of having debt, <laughs> yes? It's just a this can't be just a price issue. This would be both quality and quantity in the salary. I'm just saying the salaries are higher. I'm not saying that the doctors are just as good or just as bad or whatever. The quantity too. Oh, so yeah, we don't have. Oh, what? yeah, that's not, yesterday I showed a different set of pull down. I'm going to come to that in two minutes. And by the way, it's not just doctors. Like it's nurses too. I'm like the French nurses get paid forty-two thousand dollars a year on average. You know, it makes them lower than with us. Much not in the first um, What about other stuff? Let me spend two minutes and just blow through some numbers. This all comes from the International Federation of Health Plans. So this is looking at private insurance rates. Okay, in our country and other countries. Here are CAT scans. And I made this joke yesterday and I'll say it again. Look at Spain. <laughs> Everybody should get an abdominal CT at that price. <laughs> right? Like a little, little discomfort here. Just, this is a scan. Um, I'm kidding, I know there's radiation and all sorts of things. <laughs> I'm not actually arguing that everybody should get a CT scan scan every day, but you could do it if you can afford it. Um, appendectomies, cheap in Spain, less cheap in America. Um, here's Switzerland. Anybody been to Switzerland? Cheap country, right? <laughs> The dollar goes so far. No, I was actually I was in Geneva um, last week, 
went to a Starbucks, true story, um, not that interesting true story, but true story. Um, went to a Starbucks, got a latte, not even with any vanilla shots, just straight up latte. Grande, like not quadruple venti or anything. Uh, anybody know how much it cost me? Nine bucks. And I was hungry, I hadn't had breakfast, I got a bagel with cream cheese, another seven. It was about 20 bucks for a latte and a bagel with cream cheese. Everything in Switzerland is really expensive. But not appendectomies from your dogs. Knee replacement. Switzerland's really expensive. Except it's cheap for us. <coughs> Bypass surgery. Look at Switzerland and New Zealand and Australia. These are like not cheap countries. But Spain is kind of less expensive. But, uh, but these numbers are staggering. And they're all Trump located. I mean, bypass surgery includes cardiac surgeon salaries and nursing salaries. So all the stuff I showed you shows up in here. Okay, so, yes. And are you talking resource cost or are you talking reimbursement? That, those are reimbursements. Those are reimbursements. I can show you Medicare reimbursements which are lower, but still higher than reimbursements in other countries. <coughs> Reimbursements. Because reimbursements is what shows up in your insurance bill at the end of the year when you have to pay your premium. So, yes. So, you know, here at the University of Chicago, um, we are always told that a tiny fraction of the patients who are responsible for all the profits and all yep. the bills. Yep. And then that is used to subsidize the fact that people are uninsured and many people are essentially underinsured. Yep. So, when we look at reimbursement, So as you know, David, that's a really complicated question. Um, so let's take a minute and think through that. Um, so the point is that it depends on the system. You might have 20% Medicaid, 30% Medicaid, 40-50% Medicare, and 20 or 30% Medicaid. Sure, that might be a typical, I don't know what the mix is here, but that's not unreasonable for a uh, an academic medical center in the middle of a big city. Right? Um, and so the standard argument that every hospital executive has made uh, to me over the years um, is we lose money like, like we're going out of business and we would on Medicaid. We kind of lose money a little, but not too much on Medicare. And thank God we have privately insured patients who kind of think they don't. It's complicated because these are not fixed things. What I mean by that is, what if you were an all Medicaid provider? Could you survive? You could. You would just pay your doctors and nurses a lot less. Right? And your executives would get paid less. And you'd have less resources. And it's complicated also by the fact that 80% of hospitals are nonprofits. So every year they want to make sure their expenses come out approximately where their revenues are. And you know, because hospitals are not allowed to make profits, or those 80% are not allowed to make profits. But if you really look at their underlying cost structure, I don't see the cost structure as a big thing like, oh my god, it costs us $10,000 to do a bypass surgery, whether we want it or not. If you were in a system that constrained you and put financial resources, you could figure out how to do cardiac surgery for 9,000 or 8,000. Uh, so it's, it's a very dynamic thing, which is why I say it's, it's complicated. Uh, there are lots of hospitals where 80% of their, their patient mix is Medicare and Medicaid, uh, and they do just fine, or 90%. I want to talk about health outcomes, because uh, we talk about access, we talk about cost, we're really expensive, a lot of administrative <coughs> price, but how about health outcomes? So this is the, this is the uh, data that you've all seen, some version of, which is when it comes to life expectancy, we're different, right? Here's Japan. I think it's 2016 data, by the way. Uh, doesn't matter. We're really kind of different. Uh, here's another piece of data. I took out America, and I put in three new places. Anybody know what these three places are? I've numbered them. Cuba? Acuba. No, it's not, these are not countries. Chicago? 
No, that's it. That would have been interesting. I should have gotten to talk about it. Hawaii, Minnesota, Connecticut. You want Sweden? We've got Sweden. <laughs> Minnesota, little tiny bit different than Sweden. But essentially the same life expectancy as Sweden. So that's interesting. Right? Minnesota's got the same life expectancy as Sweden. That's not a good thing, that's because Minnesota is Sweden. <laughs> a lot of Swedes or a lot of uh, people from uh, Scandinavian countries in Minnesota. It's true. Hawaii is interesting. It's right there, ahead of Canada, Netherlands, UK, and Denmark. Denmark, by the way, is Bernie Sanders' favorite model. It always talks about Denmark. In Denmark, they do this. Uh, and then there's a right between Denmark and Europe. Uh, but the point is that America is a really complicated place. And when we talk about places like Finland and say, no, Finland's population, their health outcomes are awesome. Why can we be like Finland? I always say, yeah, Finland is awesome. Anybody been to Finland? Like, it's awesome. It's great. Um, probably been watch to Helsinki, but I thought it was great. Um, Finland is 20% smaller than Massachusetts. Right? And Massachusetts is not a big state. So national comparisons are complicated by things like this. We have a ton of heterogeneity in our population. And if you want me to compare Minnesota to Sweden, that's fine. But if you want me to compare America to Sweden, you just have to sort of think about what we're comparing and how much of that is after science. Um, but at the key point I want to make is that to the extent that we think healthcare systems have something to do with life expectancy, we've got places that look just as good as, as Northern uh, and Western Europe. Questions, comments, or thoughts on that? Here's your natal mortality, another place where we do very badly. But here's a different statistic, which is near natal mortality given low birth weight, where we actually tend to do pretty well. Two very contrasting stories. Neonatal mortality is about a whole bunch of stuff. Stuff we do in the hospital, <laughs> a lot of stuff that happens outside of the hospital, before the hospital. This is a bit of a closer measure of what happens in the hospital, given low birth. Right? Does that make sense to people, what I'm doing in terms of contrasting these things? Because I'm trying to set up a tension that I want to actually discuss in about few minutes. Stroke mortality. If you're going to have a stroke, and again, please avoid it, take your blood pressure medicine. Um, strokes are bad, but if you're going to do it somewhere, it's a good place to do it. Our 30 day stroke mortality is much better. This one, I'm just going to say a little caveat. I think these numbers are pretty much right. How people are measuring this little variation, but it won't explain the fact that we're like half the mortality of, uh, of Canada. So that's really interesting. And that gets in many ways to the point you brought up earlier. When you say, when I say to you, AMI, AMI care is twice as expensive, or stroke care is twice as expensive in America as it is in Canada. <laughs> Am I just comparing apples to apples? Or is there a lot of stuff that's going on that may or may not explain the higher costs in the United States? And then, of course, it begs all sorts of questions like, is it worth it? Is it worth spending twice as much if we're going to get lower stroke mortality, but we won't get better population health outcomes? That's a different question. Reflections or thoughts on this? Anybody surprised by this? Yeah. Do you have any idea what interventions we're doing that we're not doing? Or what? So, so nobody. So this is where what this paper has done is made me realize all the answers I don't understand. Like I don't understand what explains this. So what we have done since then is we got individuals from each of these countries and a couple more work with ministries to get claims data. And now we're working with investigators in each of these countries to look at actual patterns of care across a whole bunch of things. 
outpatient and inpatient. How do we manage diabetes versus how do you manage diabetes? How do we manage stroke versus how do you manage stroke? So as you might imagine, getting 13 countries to all collect, uh, analyze, and report claims data the exact same way uh, is an endeavor. Uh, but we're probably uh, uh, six months away from our first set of answers on that. But I haven't seen any data yet, so I don't, I don't even know where to begin to answer that question. I think that's also what the NFG2 What's that? Yeah, G2 yeah, rates. There's a bunch of stuff we can look at here. We just haven't done it yet. Are you also looking at issues of absolute treatment? So are things correctly identified in the stroke? Because we find a lot more strokes in the event of three people die, but a much lower mortality rate. Right. And, th and that is particularly true in the age of troponins on everybody for heart attack. So these are, these are challenges in, in international comparisons, right? Where you're trying to get the same population. It's complicated, yes. So for your neonatal data, I really wonder if part of it, uh, as a pediatrician, we hear from our European colleagues that the rate of pregnancy terminations for genetic malformations is much higher in Europe than yes. it is in the United States. Yes. So fundamentally, we have more children being born with genetic disorders that have a higher rate of death within the first year of life yep. than in those countries. Yeah, these are all the subtleties that should make you very um, careful about international comparisons. Because it's easy to say, we suck. Our numbers are terrible. Because what are you comparing? And you, you want to make sure you get to that. And that is, in many ways, let me just see what else I have data-wise. Um, we talked, somebody brought up mammograms earlier as like a preventive thing. So we're pretty good at it. Denmark, okay, Bernie's country. Um, <laughs> does very well, uh, and we're not like gangbusters better than everybody else. But like you know, there are places where the numbers are much much lower. Um, we're pretty good. So, I, you know, I'm basically done. Let me just make the point, a couple of summary points, and I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions. And I think Dave here is supposed to come up here and join me, or maybe with however it may be. We're the only country without universal health coverage. Um, once you're in the system, our access looks okay. Not awesome, but not bad. We have a really high cost healthcare system, which is tragic, primarily driven by administrative costs and prices. And health outcomes for people of the population are worse, but if you were to get sick, it's a good system to do it. And the last kind of question I want to ask, uh, and I want to kind of finish with this, which is when I started off this. Mm -hmm. Talk, I talk about what are good health systems, what are good health care systems, where do you want your mom to get her health care? I didn't begin the question by saying, what's a good society to live in? Which is a related but different question. So, so let's talk about things like uh, life expectancy. What drives life expectancy? The health care system? How many people think what your doctor does, what the hospital does, are the primary drivers of life expectancy? Anyone? No, right? Like, come on. No. Like, your education, where you live, the neighborhood, the environment, the food you eat, uh, and, and 20 other things are more important than how good your doctor is, or whether you can even get in to see your doctor, and how long a wait you have. Those are important issues, but they're not as important. But it's interesting that whenever we talk about American health care system, we pop up life expectancy and say our life expectancy is lower, our health care system is less effective. So one really important issue to think about is what is within the boundaries of the health care system? What are we going to hold doctors and hospitals accountable for? Versus what are we not going to hold doctors and hospitals and nurses accountable um, And my general take, and I will stop, is once people get into the system, as pricey as it is, as difficult it can be as times, we're a pretty good healthcare system. By the way, that somehow in American health policy makes me deeply unpopular. Because in the American health policy, the mindset has been our, our healthcare system is broken. And my argument is our, we have all sorts of societal problems that our healthcare system isn't able to deal with. But once you get into the healthcare system, Stroke mortality, AMI mortality look pretty good. 
Mammogram look, rates look pretty good. Access looks pretty good. You can get into a specialist reasonably fast. Yeah, you can pay a lot for it. But it's not so bad. Push back. Tell me why you disagree with that. You know? Yeah. It would really be very nice to look at, um, you know, to look at these piracy within yes. the context of those countries. Because yes. If you look at quality of health care, you know, in all of those countries that you're comparing to, to the United States, yep. you don't see the huge disparity that we see here. Yep. So on the average, uh, you might think the health care here is good for people who have access. Yep. Well, many don't have access, and if you're looking at downtown, you know, go southwest, uh, yep. eight miles, life expectancy difference is 14, 16 years. Yep. So Or do you want to use life expectancy as a broader measure of 